As investors, we're always looking for ways to get the maximum returns on our investments. Many of us try to achieve this by looking for cheap, popular, high quality or small cap stocks. These classifications of stocks that we like to invest in are known as the investing factors. And in the same way that food can be broken down into different nutrient categories, the returns of a stock can be broken down into a combination of investing factors. Bread, for example, is made up of a combination of nutrients such as carbs, protein and vitamins. The returns of a stock can be broken down into a combination of factors such as value, size, quality and momentum. Some of these factors are well known, like value and size, but others, like quality and momentum, are slightly more mysterious. But why should we care about these factors? Well, these investing factors are proven through detailed academic studies based on empirical evidence to give greater risk-adjusted returns. So listen up. In this video, we're going to go through the basics of factor investing and we're going to explain why these factors actually exist and then how you can implement them into your own portfolio. We'll first lay the groundwork with factor investing and how we actually identify these factors. And then we'll look at how you can target them in your own portfolio. Let's get into it. Whilst many people believe that stock picking or market timing is a gift bestowed upon a selected few by the gods, let there be gains! <laughs> well, we'd like to think that it's more than just inherent skill or divine luck. The way that people brush off the investing success of Warren Buffett as some sort of divine ability is kinda strange. I bet that really annoys him actually. He puts all this work into analysing stocks and then people are just like, well, it's Buffett, isn't it? In the last few years, researchers may have finally discovered the secret terms that Warren Buffett has been using for all these years. We can now actually quantify some of the risks that enable some stocks to outperform the broader market. But before we jump into the analysis, we need to take a look at some of the fundamental assumptions that the academic community made before identifying these risk factors. Big assumption number one. In order to beat the market, we have to assume that the markets are efficient. This essentially means that the markets are priced correctly and price discovery is taking place. Whenever information goes public, investors act on that information. If good news is released, then more investors want to invest in the stock because of a promising future which drives up the price of a stock. So the information has caused the investors to act, which almost immediately is reflected in the stock price. Sometimes the new information can be over or undervalued, which is where investors' behavior comes in. Psychological factors like recency bias or confirmation bias can cause investors to act irrationally. The markets don't need to be perfectly efficient though. We all know that's definitely not the case. So based on this first assumption, we have big assumption number two. If the markets are efficient, we can assume that all assets have the same risk-adjusted returns. Not the same returns, no, 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 the same risk-adjusted returns. Risk-adjusted returns are a way of quantifying the returns of a stock based on the amount of risk that it is taking. Don't worry if this idea isn't straightforward. We'll cover how we measure risk in a little while. Research suggests that all asset classes, whether it's bonds, stocks or real estate have similar risk adjusted returns. This is because the return of an asset class is in fact dictated by the amount of risk that an asset class carries. Based on the assumption that the market is efficient and that all asset classes have similar risk adjusted returns, then we should diversify across as many risk factors as possible. Okay, so that's the basic assumptions out of the way. So what are these investing risk factors? Well, here's a few of them. The market beta or market premium, which is linked to the return of holding stocks. The size factor, the return associated with holding stocks from smaller companies. The value factor, the returns associated with buying and holding stocks that are undervalued compared to others. The momentum factor, the returns associated with holding stocks that have performed well recently. And the quality factor, the returns associated with holding companies that are profitable. Now, this is just a small list of the factors that have been discovered by the academic community. Community. Over the last few years, the number of investing factors have exploded. There are now over 600 that have been identified. Many of these factors are found by analysing the historical stock return data. 600 factors is a dizzying amount. In fact, it's gotten so ridiculous that many researchers have started calling it the factor zoo. And just like when you visit the zoo, you only want to see the coolest animals. You know, the giraffes, the elephants, the rhinos. Forget about those weird little capybara things or the bats in the twilight zone or whatever it was. No thank you. We need a way to cut through the noise of a factor zoo and get to the good bits. And luckily, Andy Birkin and Larry Swedrow have given us a map. No, not that kind of map. It's your complete guide to factor-based investing. In this book, Birkin and Swedrow outline four key criteria that we can use to pick out the best factors. What these tools allow us to do is to cancel out any factors that are just correlation-based. And by correlation-based, we mean any factors that are just coincidental rather than cause and effect. One great example of this data mining is in a paper by David Lineweber and Dave Kreider. Their data analyzed thousands of economic metrics in order to determine which was the best indicator of the positive returns for the S&P 500. And they found that, well, actually, take a guess. 
what would be the leading indicator of the positive returns of the S&P 500? GDP? Earnings growth? No. The tightest correlation to the S&P 500 out of any data series that they could find was Bangladesh butter production, which explained 99% of the S&P 500's movement. Huh? Okay, so back to how we find out which factors are legit. The four criterion that Birkin and Swedro created to remove any ridiculous factors are Number one, persistence. Does the factor hold over time? This seems sensible. If the factor has only existed for a few years, then it could disappear in the future. We want our factors to be consistent. Number two, pervasive. Does the factor work in different countries, sectors, and assets? Again, this makes sense. If the factor only shows up in one country, then it won't be any use to investors that are globally diversified. Number three, investable. Can we actually invest in the factor for low fees? If we can't invest in the thing, then what's the point? Number four, intuitive. Can we give a logical, risk-based argument as to why the factor actually exists? This is a tricky one because it becomes subjective. But really, if you don't believe that the factor should exist in the first place, then will you really have the cojones to hold it when the times get tough? Using this criteria, we can reduce the number of investing factors from 600 to 8. We won't cover all 8 in this video, but we'll cover it in the future. I promise you. One final thing to note before diving into these factors is how they are measured. Typically, the factors are defined by taking the performance of the top 30% of stocks that match the factor and subtracting the performance of the bottom 30% of stocks that don't match the factor. This will become a bit clearer soon. First up, let's take a look at the market beta or equity risk factor. Market beta was the first of these factors to be discovered, and it was first modelled by William Sharp in his Capital Asset Pricing Model, or CAPM for short. Now you might be thinking, well, how is market beta a factor? It's just the market. We've got to remember that stocks aren't the only asset class that these factors apply to. So even the idea that stocks outperform bonds needs to be questioned. You may have heard of market beta before and think that it's volatility risk. This is a common misconception of a market risk, but in all fairness, market beta is linked to volatility. It's really just a measurement of how much an asset's price moves in relation to the broader market that the asset is contained in. We're a bit nerdy here at IQ Investing, so here's the math for the fellow nerds out there. The beta coefficient is calculated by the quotient of a covariance of a stock and its variance, where RE is the return of an individual stock, RM is the return of the overall market, covariance is how changes in stock returns are related to changes in market returns, variance is how far the market's data points spread out from their average value. <laughs> First we need to talk about the covariance of a stock. Compare the sum of the difference between its historical return and its average return. Then it is multiplied by the sum of the difference between the benchmark's historical return and its average return. The variance of the stock is the standard deviation of its return, basically how much the stock return fluctuates around its mean. <sighs> Quick mass. An example of this would be a tech stock with a market beta of 1.5. What this basically means that if the market raised by 10% in the year, we can explain this tech stock to raise by 15%. Conversely, if the market fell by 20%, then we could expect the stock to fall by 30%. And here lies the reason why market volatility is so often compared to risk. The beta gives us an idea of how much the stock price will fluctuate compared to the market. Okay, so stocks carry risk due to their volatility. But how do we calculate how much risk we're taking on and how much we should be rewarded? Well, this is called the market premium. And to calculate the premium, we need to compare the return of the market to the return of a riskless asset. Of course, no asset is truly riskless, but the closest thing we have are one month US Treasury bills. The T-bills are thought to be a riskless asset due to their short duration and their backing by the US government. The US has never defaulted on a payment. This gives investors the confidence that the US will always pay their debts. A Lannister always Don't pays say it. Only a handful of countries have never defaulted, England being one of them. So, to calculate the market premium, we take the average return of a stock market and subtract it from the average return of one month T-bills. The historical data shows that in the US, the market premium has returned 8.3% from 1927 through to 2015. This means that over this time period, on an annual basis, the stock market has returned 8.3% more than T-bills on average. This is the market premium and it's essentially the risk-adjusted returns that we get from investing in the stock market. But before we get carried away, if we're going to define the market beta as a factor, then we need to check it against the four criteria that we mentioned before. Number one, persistence. Have stocks historically outperformed the riskless asset and by how much? Well, yes, as we mentioned, the market premium has returned 8.3% on average in the US from 1927 to 2015. Over the one year, three year, five year, 10 year and 20 year periods, the premium has returned positive returns. Look closely at this table. Over one year, the market factor has only existed 66% of the time. That means on average, one in every three years, the market underperforms the riskless asset. That's kind of crazy and shows why we really need to be investing over the long term. At the other end of the table, we see that over a 20 year period, the market premium is 96%. So if we commit to investing for 20 years, 
96% of the time, you'll get better returns than the US T-bill. Not 100%? No. Nothing can be certain with investing. If the small chance of failure didn't exist, then neither would the risk factor. Number two, pervasive. Have stocks outperformed in every global market? Well, yes, the market factor has been observed in every global market from 1900 to 2015. It has been the highest in Sweden at 6.6% and the lowest in Belgium at 3.1%. Remember, this isn't just the return, but it's the return relative to the riskless asset. Number three, investable. Can we easily invest in stocks? Well, yes, we can invest in the stock market and for pretty low fees, especially when compared to the historical average. Number four, intuitive. Does it make sense that stocks outperform US T-bills? Yes, the risk associated with investing is linked to the economic cycles that companies are subject to. As an economy goes into recession, investors tend to pull money out of the stock market as they need it for more immediate costs. This drawdown of capital tends to reduce stock prices and so holding during these periods is difficult. So we can be fairly confident that the market beta factor is real. But what about the other factors? We'll skip the detailed analysis, but if you're interested, then we can make a video on it in the future. So just let us know. As we mentioned earlier, these investing factors may not always give positive returns. In fact, they can go for long periods where the premium is negative. This often leads to the headline claiming that a particular factor is dead. But just remember that these factors can be negative for long periods of time. But when they finally resurface, the returns can be exceptional. The size factor is the return associated with the market cap of companies. Historically, small cap stocks have outperformed large cap stocks. But by how much? To calculate this, in the case of a size factor, we take the average returns of small cap stocks and subtract it by the average return of large cap stocks. Between 1927 and 2015, the size premium has been 3.3% in the US. In practice, this means that if you hold more small cap stocks than you do large cap stocks, then you can expect greater returns. But it's not quite as simple as that, as not all small caps are created equal. This brings us on to our next factor. The value factor is linked to the returns associated with undervalued assets. Historically, relatively cheap stocks have outperformed relatively expensive stocks. To calculate the value factor, we take the returns of the cheapest stocks available on the market and we subtract the performance from the most expensive stocks. The value of a company is usually defined by its book to market value. Between 1927 and 2015, the value premium has been 4.8%. The size and value factors are often referred to as SMB and HML. That's small minus big and high minus low. And research has suggested that by combining these two factors, we can expect even greater returns. The momentum factor is the tendency for those stocks that have performed well in the recent past to keep on performing well, and for those stocks that have performed poorly to keep on performing poorly. This is typically a short-term effect, so the momentum factor tracks stocks over a 12-month period. The momentum factor has had a premium of 9.6% from 1927 to 2015. Not only is that more than the market premium that we discussed earlier, but it's also extremely consistent. Over a 20-year period, the momentum factor has been positive 100% of the time. This weird result lends itself to the fact that the momentum factor is explained more by investor behaviour than it is the fundamentals of stocks. Investors naturally try to chase positive returns so the momentum factor makes the most of this trend. However, this factor is notoriously difficult to capture, as it requires a higher trading frequency and keeping up with the ever-changing market can be costly. The quality factor is the tendency for stocks with high profitability to outperform stocks with low profitability. This factor arises as cash flows, controlling operating costs and maximising profits are all key to a company's long-term success. The profitability factor has returned 3.1% in the US from 1927 to 2015. In practice, this means that holding more profitable companies in your portfolio will give you higher risk-adjusted returns. Here's a summary of all of the factors we've discussed in this video with their respective premiums and odds of outperformance. As we can see, the momentum factor carries the greatest premium and consistency, but it is difficult to capture in reality. Although the quality factor has the lowest premium, it's been targeted by great investors like Buffett and Graham for years. So how do we get exposure to these factors? Well, many investment firms offer ETFs or funds that are designed to target these factors. Dimensional Fund Advisors are an investment firm that specialise in factor investing. They take their lead from the academic research that suggests targeting their premium will give improved returns over time. Dimensional products are only available through Dimensional Approved Fund Advisors so their ETFs aren't as freely available as normal ETFs. The BlackRock Out Share Edge Factor ETFs are more openly available and they have a number of funds that target investing factors such as the IWSZ and IWVL ETFs that track small cap and value stocks. Check out these ETFs if you're interested in exploring them further. We've really only scratched the surface when it comes to factor investing in this video. 
So if you're interested in more reading, we'll leave a link to some books in the comments below. If you want to see more factory investing videos in the future, be sure to let us know. If you enjoyed the video, then make sure to smash the like button and subscribe to the channel for more IQ investing based content. Also, you can follow us on Instagram if you want to see more from us on there. As always, thanks for watching.